What's up, guys? This is Andy from the Football Card Quest, and you're watching the Sports Card Strategy Show on the NoOffSeason.com Sports Card Network. Be sure to check out FootballCardQuest.com for in-depth football card research and selling tips, because we all know there is no off-season. What's up, everybody? I'm Paul Hickey with NoOffSeason.com. This is the Sports Card Strategy Show brought to you by Graybo's Sports Cards. Graybo's Sports Cards is a local hobby shop owned by Gray Burnett, Ryan Fitz, and Duke Denny One Time Dodson. They're located in the Arts District of Richmond, Virginia. Graybo's Sports, the best selection of raw and graded singles in the Mid Atlantic and a wide variety of wax. Graybo's Breaks on whatnot and or drip five nights a week. Listeners of Sports Card Strategy can receive a 10% discount from Graybo's on drip, whatnot, or their website at graybo's.co by entering the code STRATEGY2023. You can follow all of Graybo's news and updates on Instagram at graybo's underscore cards. Don't forget to get a free 30-day trial at NoOffSeason.com today to help you make money flipping sports cards, build your sports card investment portfolio, get unlimited advice from our experts, and take sports card school to navigate the hobby. That's NoOffSeason.com. Get your free 30-day trial today. All the data we use on the Sports Card Strategy Show is from MarketMoversApp.com. Use code NOOFFSEASON at MarketMoversApp.com to get 20% off for life after a free 14-day trial. All right, let's get to the Sports Card Strategy. What's up, everyone? Connor Barnett here, head of content at NoOffSeason.com. It is just a couple minutes after noon over here in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm alongside my man, Paul Hickey, pumped for another uh, episode of the Sports Card Strategy Show. Paul, how are we doing today? Laser focused on helping people make money flipping sports cards. Super excited to have all of you with us. Real excited to get into it today, Connor. Feeling great. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Real quick before we hop into all the good stuff we got packed into today, let's do some housekeeping. Over at NoOffSeason.com, we have launched Sports Card School, a safe place for noobs, advanced flippers, and high rollers alike to learn how to navigate the hobby and ultimately build a collection that increases in value. A little new antidote for you guys. If you want to simply shop one-off lessons at NoOffSeason.com for Sports Card School, every lesson is now available individually for non-premium subscribers uh, to simply a la carte the lessons they want. Go to SportsCardSchool.com for more information there. Also, be sure to get a free 30-day trial at NoOffSeason.com today to start learning our guidelines, strategies, and plays to help you make money flipping sports cards to fund your PC and other things in your life. Quick update on the one-on-one -on -one sports card strategist package. We have filled the spots that Paul discussed last week for January, uh, but spots will open up back again in February. So to get more information and see if this package may be a good fit for you, email Paul at NoOffSeason.com. All right, Paul. Uh, again, I'm excited to hop in today. We got a bunch of good stuff. This is going to be a fantastic episode for the listeners. We're going to talk how to win with Tops Now Plays. If we had $1,000, where would we place that money? The 1K Budget Builder is back. How to make money cracking slabs. Dr. Cracks Cracks. NoOffSeason.com NFL Playoff Selling Cheat Sheet. A fantastic resource that Paul has thrown together. Uh, and the 2024 goals from our friend, golf card collector, Mike Lacusta of Fondling Cardboard. But before we get into that, let's go ahead and do some live chat love. We got a lot of good comments in the in the comment section already. Kicking things off is my man, Oh My Shoes. Paul with the CTA, the call to action last week to get shoes back in the live chat. Says, greetings, my dude. Shoes, we're happy to have you back. Good to see you as always. We got Dr. Crack in the house. Chad Gill, good morning. Chad, good afternoon, I should say. Janelle Shu, hello, Janelle. We got Ron Blankenship. Sean G of AZ. Shane Graham, good morning, good afternoon, Shane, as well as Fly Heat Cards. Uh, we got Power Bros Collect, happy to be here for the live. Hoping that this uh, little bit of scheduling change can get some new faces in here, as well as retain the usuals. One Galaxy Germ, a popular face as of late. Laser or Laser, hey gang, we got Janelle Shu again, sorry. And then uh, the Card Hunter and the Cardboard Corner. 
All right, that was a mouthful, but we're absolutely winning with everyone in the live chat this morning. Speaking of winning, Paul, why don't you go ahead and hop into how they can win uh, on some Tops Now plays? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's talk about how to win with Tops Now plays and how not to lose. And we're going to use my Connor Bedard play as the example here where I won big, and it's an update for everybody on that. So it's a little win of the week, if you will. But also, you made a point, I think, recently, Connor, that I, I've learned a lot by trial and error. And that could that could not be more more accurate. I mean, that is the most accurate statement anyone will ever make on this show. I have learned everything I've done by trial and error. And we want you to learn from our trial and error. That's 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 our goal. So everything I talk about is all with that experience. Much like Dr. Crack. Dr. Crack talks all the time about how he doesn't talk about anything on this show that he doesn't do. And we're gonna hear from Dr. Crack later on in the show, so stay tuned for that with Dr. Crack's Cracks. But I'm the same way. I don't talk about anything on this show that I haven't done. And if I do allude to anything, I give the full disclaimer that I have not done it. So um, we're gonna get into my Connor Bedard play, how to win with tops now plays. And I say how not to lose because I've gotten a lot of questions from the audience about specific tops now plays, whether or not they can win with those plays. So I'm going to break that down. And again, I just want to reiterate to everybody in the live chat or listening on the podcast apps or watching later on right here at youtube.com slash Paul Hickey. We love all of you. We've changed up our time mainly because we feel like it's gonna be the best time moving forward for us to do the best job giving you the most valuable content based on our entire schedule. It's not to leave anyone out. We hope you can join us. And if you can't join us in the live chat, definitely leave a comment below. We're gonna to get to your comment. You can DM us at Sports Card Strategy on Instagram. You can join the Discord at sportscardstrategy.com and we're gonna get you there. Or you can always email me or Connor at paul at nooffseason.com or Connor, C-O-N-N-E-R, at nooffseason.com. We see Justin Stewart's joined. Chris, Chris Escobedo, good to see you guys. Appreciate you joining. Okay, let's jump into it. So first of all, if you go back and listen to the December 29th episode of The Overflow Show, you can get the full breakdown of all the different Bedard stickers that Tops has released. That's at nooffseason.com. You can find it. I'm not going to get into the fact that Tops has released several of these Connor Bedard rookie stickers, but I will say this. Tops holds the licensing for NHL stickers, but not cards. Upper Deck has cards, but Bedard's Young Guns, which will be the right card, hasn't hit the market yet. Thus, this was always meant to be a very quick flip. But Tops now, immediate to PSA submission, Tops released a total of approximately five different Bedard stickers released with Rookie on the side, going down the side of them. So that was a significant uh, part in the decision-making process to make this play. So the recap is I bought a 20-pack of 2023 Connor Bedard Rookie sticker number 15 on October 30th, 2023, directly from tops.com. I submitted them immediately to PSA upon their arrival at my residence on November 18th, 2023. They arrived at PSA actually only three days later, November 21st, uh, 2023. And PSA completed the order on December 21st, 2023. That's a month turnaround time. So we've had people commenting and telling us that they're having a similar experience with PSA. And uh, man, PSA is fast right now. So that's great. Now, the grades. This is important. The grades are super important in these plays. Uh 19 of them were tens and one was a nine. So right then I knew this was going to be a win of the week for me at some point on the sports card strategy show. I immediately listed them in 10 day auctions to end on new year's day. Okay. And I'll, I'll break that down here in a second. They all sold and were paid for immediately upon the auctions ending. The average gross sale price for all the PSA tens was right at $60. The high sale was 86, the low was 53 for the PSA 10s. The PSA 9 sold for $28. Um, so total invested, including the cards and the grading fee, was $420. The total gross profit, so what I got back in my bank account, was $1,100. Pretty significant to get that back in your bank account. The total net profit after taking out the $420 and the other fees, $507.20. So this is what we want. We want people putting in $420, 
getting back 1100 and getting a net profit of $507.20. Like that's the type of play we want people doing, right? So <clears throat> the takeaway though for this segment is that I've had a lot of people DMing me about various other tops now cards. And I and I love that about this show and I love that about our audience. Like we we are here to do many, many things, one of which is to inspire people to take our guidelines and our strategies and implement their own plays. The intricacy here with the tops now, though, is that you have to be very, very specific about the, the strategy. The guidelines, the guidelines can't be executed in a vacuum. It has to be put together into a strategy. So for example, you can't just buy any tops now release of a popular player and get them graded at PSA and turn around and sell them for a profit when you get them. Like those are three different things that I just laid out. Those would be guidelines. You can't take those guidelines and put them into a strategy to make plays and make money off that. You have to have specific guidelines to execute a strategy for a Tops Now play. So I've had people DMing me, for example, about cards like the Tops Now Otani Dodgers card the signed card, the one with Yamamoto in the Dodgers uniform, the one with Otani and Yamamoto together, the, the Bronny James one, the Caitlin Clark one. Okay. It's not that you can't make money doing plays related to those cards. It's that I'm not signing off personally on advising you on going out and buying those tops now cards and making money on them why the bedard play is significantly different than grabbing a caitlin clark a Bronny james a yamamoto or an otani is because yamamoto otani Bronny, caitlin those are not their first cards and they are far from the right cards this is because they already have tops chrome rookies or first Bowman Chrome cards and autos. So it's possible to make money on these cards because they're good players, but it's the equivalent of going out and buying like a second or third year card of a good player and hoping you can profit from it. It's not a great idea. You could get lucky and you could get a parallel. Um, so base card parallels are randomly ins inserted into every print run. You can look for different ones for different releases, but for example, an out of 49 blue, out of 25 purple, out of 10 red, out of five orange, one of one gold. These are randomly inserted into the lucky lucky ones that get them in addition to the base card order. So you could get 20 of the regular base and then you could get one of these parallels on top of that. That's happened to me before. I did that with a Ken Griffey Jr. card back in 2021. I lost on the base ones big time. I was lucky that I got a parallel and I profited off of that a little bit. So again, that's an example of a trial and error. I've bought the wrong Tops Now cards for years before I got good at flipping like I have been for the last 18 months. And now I'm telling you how to avoid my errors and how to, to go deeper into the strategies related to my wins. It's highly unlikely that you're going to get one of these parallels and you're going to be in your order for 100. I'm going to break down why not to go buy just any Tops Now card. So you go in, let's say you want to buy a Caitlin Clark, okay? You're going to be in $109-ish, depending on your sales tax and everything like that, and a minimum of about $300 for the grading fee because you're, you're going to have 20 of these. Now, I'm, I'm, I'll give or take a little bit on the grading fee. Some people are going to pick at me and be like, well, now PSA has got this special. Oh, you could just do like 10 of them. Yeah, sure. I get that. I'm going to break that down. So just hang with me. You're going to be $400 into a play that could make you around $30 per PSA 10 maximum because that's the equivalent of a second or third year base card in a PSA 10 for a popular player. By the time you've sold all 20 for $30 each in PSA 10, assuming you get all 10s, you're going to be looking at $400. $50 total after fees, which means you spent $400 to make $450 tops, no pun intended. So this is not worth your time. You need to be at around $65 to $75 consistently on the gross sale price to do what I did with the Wemby's and the Bedards. I, I spoke about the Wemby's last week's show. And you can still only achieve that when there is a high demand for the player's cards, but little to no other cards or stickers in this case available, right? So again, to win with tops now, 
You have to have the right card. The player has to have very little or no cards on the market yet. Bedard, Wemby at the time. It has to be the right player. And it has to be the right time. You have to be able to quick flip, turn these very, very quickly, immediately, if you will, before the player's other top cards come out. So this is exactly what I did. This is exactly what Lefty and I did with the Wemby tops now and what I did with the Bedards. So honestly, the moment has passed now with Bedard, guys. Like the moment's gone. He got injured, unfortunately, over the weekend. So because I had this play planned out, I put myself in a position to be fortunate enough to liquidate before the injury happened. I'm not going to sit here and pat myself on the back because I moved out of my Bedards before he got injured. That's not what I'm saying. And I'm not, I'm not like sticking my nose up at people who are holding Bedards right now. I, I, did, I did get fortunate that he didn't get injured while I was in, in the middle of making the play. But again, we know that athletes can get injured all the time. And that's why we need to move in and out quickly of these plays. So the moment has passed with Bedard. This is why I talked about it in October. This is why you have to listen all the time, join our premium membership, stay involved, and you'll be able to execute like us. So we want you to win. Um, we don't want you to make the mistakes that I've made in the past. Hopefully this makes sense in terms of why some tops now plays work and others don't. Fantastic breakdown, Paul. There's a lot to unwrap there. I think you did a I think you did a phenomenal job of of really uh, specifying the specific strat guidelines that we use to build your strategy here. And I love uh, the real life example that you've given, the actual profits you've made, guys. We want you to see how these are how these are panning out for this. Obviously, this was a huge win for Paul. I don't think I really need to expand too much on the the actual play. However, I do have there's a lot to unpack there. I do have a couple questions that I think can. Uh, dive us a little bit deeper into the scenario to take more takeaways uh, from this play. So kicking things off, this play that you made with Bedard, in in my vision, um, I know we're discussing the tops now. It, it's a similar thing to Wimby, uh, just because it's first cards, big hype, things like that. We don't really have a sell marker here. It's something that we preach really frequently. Paul, will you just touch on some of the intangibles needed for both player and cards for plays like this to exist without a sell marker being present? Yeah, it's got to have a rookie card shield or logo on it so Wemby's the reason i like the Wemby is, is because they had the rc shield on it. it it's not the it's obviously not the the same rc shield that you would see on uh, a bowman chrome u release if you go back and look at the Wemby, where he's in his draft night suit that's what i'm referring to um it's got to be a card that doesn't have other better cards or more desirable cards of that player already on the market to compete with. So like people keep talking about like, I love all of you. I love all of you, by the way, but I'm going to, I'm going to say something here. I'm going to sound like a little bit of a dick for a second. All of you keep asking and, and chattering about this Caitlin Clark tops now stuff, guys. I don't see anything special about this where it at all supersedes her. She has a Bowman Chrome U first. She has autos. She has parallel. Go buy those guys. Don't buy the tops now, Caitlin Clark. So, so like there is nothing other than the fact that we all love Caitlin Clark. This is guys, this is the equivalent of buying like a fourth year Luka Doncic prism. Th that's what it is. This Caitlin Clark tops now, unless you luckily get a parallel, I understand they're cheap. I understand they're like $4 a card. I get that. But I just gave you the example of like you're gonna put in you're gonna put in three to four hundred to get fifty out of that. That's too risky for me. So I mean, do guys do it if you want. You can you can. It's not that you can't make money. You can do it if you want. But I would rather see if you're gonna put four hundred dollars in. And this is what I've been DMing people on on IG. And I would Connor. I would like to. I would like to star some of these comments here in the live chat and do a little do do a little. Uh, a little shout out towards the end of the episode for people commenting it. So, so stick with us, everybody for the end of the episode. Cause we're going to get to, you got great comments here. We're going to get to them. Like we, we want to talk about them with you, but guys, if you're going to put $400 in, don't put it into a tops now thing where you're going to make 50, 50 gross out of it. That's going to be like 12, that's going to be like $20 after fees. And then you're going to mail all these freaking cards. It's going to take you like, it's going to take you like a couple hours of your time to like print the labels, communicate with the buyer, mail them. Like, no, go buy one Caitlin Clark auto base auto out of Bowman Chrome with her first logo on it. 
and and flip that one card if you want to get into Caitlin Clark. Yep, great breakdown there, Paul. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to take away from the subject, but I do feel like there's like several good things within the topic. So if you feel like I'm getting too off too off brand here, definitely reel me back in. But another thing, um, there's been we've done a lot of talk lately about uh, the PSA special going on right now. Uh, their speed seemingly improving. Um, with the speed seeming to be improving, uh, do you think this will make their slabs even more valuable uh, as a result of demand increasing for their services? Um, and will we see them slow down because so many people are trying to uh, jump into this $15 special that's out right now? Yeah, I know where you're going with this. I mean, I think so. I'm going to, I might take it in a little bit of a different direction and also answer your question at the same time. A sure. lot of people have, uh, like Chad and Lefty, who we all love, and we're going to hear from, we're going to hear from Chad later in the show and, and pro probably every episode moving forward. And we're going to hear from Lefty on Wednesday's episode as well. But we love Chad and Lefty. They have, they have a, a tactic that they've talked about on the show uh, where they're sending some of them to SGC. So to me, Connor, the first thing it does is it takes that out of the equation. And thank God, because now PSA with this $15, they're, they're, they're the same price as SGC. They're a little bit slower because they're going to say it's it's actually 50 day turnaround time for the $15 price point. So you have to keep that in mind. If this is, we're talking about this being like a super quick flip. Well, 50 days in theory, like if it's the right, if it's the right uh, card for the right player. And we think that, that, that it, that the timing could work out to where there's not going to be competition yet for that card by the time we get it back get it back from tops and then get it back from PSA and fit. So really it's going to be like, it's going to take like two weeks to get it back from tops. Let's be conservative. So if you're looking at, if you've got a 70 day runway for the, for the right player, and this is going to be the right card for the next 70 days, that makes it the right time. And then you definitely need to go to P you definitely need to go to PSA because you're at the same price point as SGC. Now, the only reason now to go to SGC for any of this would be literally if you need the card back in the next seven to 10 days. And even then I still wouldn't go to SGC because I think PSA is always going to, the PSA 10 is always going to outsell an SGC 10 enough to make up for the fact that you might get it back a little bit later. And so that's the first thing that this PSA special does to me. I think the other thing from your question that's notable that I want to say is like, in my experience, in the hobby over the last five years. And I know five years is a lot longer than some of you, but it's a lot less than others of you. So I, I realize we're all, everything, everyone has like a lot of valuable information. I'm, not, I'm definitely not the only one, but in my experience, there's nothing that I've seen that would indicate that a value of a PSA slab would go down um, as a grading company. I think it's only, it's only gonna be going up as a grading company and it only has gone up. So I don't see different service levels or different promotions or even a potential backlog due to those promotions slowing down the momentum related to PSA being the one that wins in, in the next like at least five years in terms of like a, a, what slabs are worth. Sure. Yep. Perfectly answered my question there. Um, one more thing, and then I'm ready to transition to our next segment. Because the Bedard sticker play is something that we pitched several months ago uh, to people to try to get on. on. I think some people, it seems like some people jumped in a little late. Obviously, you got your cards back. You were able to make the profits. You discussed that he has been injured. I'm going to put you on the spot here. For people that are still holding him, yeah. um, what is the move right now? You know, because for what if, and to be clear, if you if you just got them back and you're like, dang, he's injured, what to do? I've actually been looking at research this morning. His card mark is actually still up roughly 10% over the last two weeks. So nice. it might not be completely too late to get these listed, but I'm curious to see what Paul thinks uh, for people that are still holding these or waiting for returns from PSA here. Yeah, love it. Dr. Crack texted us over the weekend and he was the one that broke the news yep. to us. About, Shout out Dr. Crack. <laughs> yeah, about Bedard's injury. And it was interesting because um, to the point that you just made about the data, like Chad's first thought to us in the text string was like, he's still Bedard. I wouldn't worry too much about it. And I think, I think, um, you know, Chad, feel free to correct me in the comments if if I'm if I'm paraphrasing you wrong there. But I think I think we all agree generally that everyone so so what to do. So let's say you have these these rookie stickers. Let's say they're raw or or um SGC slabbed or PSA slabbed, or, or let's say you're waiting to get them back from SGC or PSA. I think it sucks that he's injured, but I still think you stay the course. I still think you stay the course. We talked about this last week, Connor, in, in, in one of our episodes where 
when you set out to execute a plan, unless something happens like an earlier selling marker. So I'll give, I'll give the Shadur Sanders example. When I bought Shadur Onyx Auto, I thought I might not sell it till the NFL draft. He blew up against TCU and I was like, I'm selling it now for sure. And that was the right move. And so I think when you set out to execute a plan, we say don't buy a card without a selling marker. I think you stick to the plan, stay the course, wait till the Bedards come back. Or if you're holding them, keep an eye on the injury report. Do what Connor did. Continue to look at the data. If the data is that the stickers are still around, say, give or take 10 to $15 either way of the price point that you could have sold them for around the injury, I, I think you should move them. I think you should just go ahead and move out of them because the reality is you didn't... In, in that case, despite like a broken jaw, I think is what he has, despite a broken jaw, you're, you're still going to profit off of that. So in, in the end, it's like you're winning because even we talk about like, oh, what about an injury? Like that could really screw things over. Well, probably not too bad in this case. I, I think, I think you got to, I, I don't think you can wait. You can't hold this rookie sticker because the young guns is coming out. You just can't, you got to move it. And the good news is based on what you're saying, Connor is looking at the data. You're probably not moving it for that much less. Um, than you would have if you would have stayed healthy. Yep, totally agree. Fantastic breakdown. I think we covered all our basis on the tops now. Connor Bedard play there. Let's go ahead and transition into our 1K budget builder. This is a segment that I've had a lot of fun doing with our guy Lefty McKee uh, for the past couple of weeks. We're going to throw Paul Hickey in the mix here and see who he's picking. If he has $1,000 right now, how is he investing in it? We're going to look at uh, mid-tier Low end and high end cards for each of you guys, depending on what your budget is. Paul, go ahead and get after it. I said a second ago, never buy a card without a selling marker in mind. And my number one selling marker of 2024 is the 2024 NFL draft, baby. I am so pumped to be following the rumors and action and news cycle around what teams are going to do with their NFL draft picks. There's going to be trades. There's going to be all sorts of offseason movement in the NFL. And we're going to put out a lot of content at nooffseason.com about how to make money on the sports card side of that movement. Uh, so with my $1,000, I am looking at that 2024 NFL draft in mind. And with my low end card, I'm going to go ahead and get a Drake May Bowman Chrome First Refractor Auto Raw. You can find links to all the Drake May cards at nooffseason.com in our football card rankings. And one just sold for $143.34 in an auction on New Year's Day. So what I'm going to do, Connor, is I, uh, I'm i going to try to find auctions, but worst case, I'm okay making an offer for around $150 for one that I found listed for $190. So for the sake of our budget builder segment, I'm going to go ahead and, and lock in $150 uh, towards that $1,000 to buy that raw and then hold and sell during the NFL draft hype rise. And for those of you wondering, that's going to be like literally listing it in a seven-day auction that ends, uh, I believe, Thursday, uh, April 25th. You guys can test my memory. So we would be starting the auction on Thursday, April 17th. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think I'm right on. So that's my low end. My mid tier, Jaden Daniels. So the Heisman Trophy winner. I said on Dave and Adams is the chase uh, last month that I'm fading Jaden Daniels at the time. And at the end of, at the end of the month of December, I said I was fading Jaden Daniels and I am, I am because he doesn't have the right cards. He's not in Bowman U, unfortunately, which sucks. But I do believe that the astute flippers of the world, the listeners of the Sports Card Strategy Show, could make money on Daniels. And here's how. I could allocate around $250 to get a 2023 Sage Sneak Peek Gold Auto out of 100. The reason I like this is because even though it's unlicensed, it looks like he's in his LSU uniform. It looks like an LSU uniform. It doesn't look too airbrushed. And on the back of it, it does actually have the college name. And it is out of and it is a gold auto out of 100. That's why I like it. Now, there are other Daniels cards out there because there's an SSP 
with the same photo, but it's not out of 100. The ones out of 100, he actually inscribes it himself. So under his autograph, he'll put the number and then over 100. And that's pretty cool. That's what differentiates it as the right card to me because there is that limited run. It is signed by him and it is signed, noted by him that it's it's a number out of 100. You get the actual number. They are listed for, there's not many of them listed. Of course, there's only 100 of them and there's not many of them listed. Uh, they're listed for around $300 by it now or best offer. I think I could make an offer and get it for around 250. It's the same play as Drake May. Buy raw, hold, sell in seven to 10 day auctions that end right before the start of the 2024 NFL draft. We think he's going to be a top five pick. That's why we like it. So I think uh, since it looks like it's in his, L he's in his LSU uniform, you go for that one. You don't go for, again, learn from our trial and error. Don't go for the leaf, the pro set, the ones where he's in like his airbrushed old Arizona state uniform. It looks like crap. Nobody's going to want that. Trust me. Um, so now I'm in $400. I've got 600 left. So who am I going with? Selling marker, 2024 NFL draft. We already talked about two potential top 10 picks. Jaden Daniels, Drake May. The final guy. Now keep in mind, I'm already holding a crap ton of Caleb Williams. I know all of you think, all of you think I'm going to say Caleb Williams' name right now. Marvin Harrison Jr., baby. Maserati Marv. <laughs> I'm going Maserati Marv. 2023 Bowman U Chrome Green Refractor Auto out of 99. There's also, if I can't get that one for my 600, there's also a backup plan would be a Marvin Harrison Jr. Auto 150 Auto, Auto Fuchsia Mini Diamond Bowman Chrome U PSA 9. So it's already graded. So that would be great. It's listed for 650. I think I could get, if I can't get the raw out of green out of 99, for 600 on buy an hour best offer. I think I could get the auto 150 already in a PSA nine slab and just keep whatever, however I get it. I just keep it there. Don't grade it. Don't crack it. Keep it as is list in seven to 10 day auctions right before the NFL draft. So again, Thursday, April 25th, 2024 in Detroit where I'm from. Well, I'm, I'm not literally from Detroit, but I'm from the Metro Detroit area. So I'm looking at listing all of these on either Monday, April 15th or Thursday, April 17th, all likely at around 8.30 p.m. Eastern time so that they end 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. That is my 1K budget builder. Go make money, everybody. I love it. A couple things I want to take away from this budget builder. One, I've been talking about this for like the last four shows. Efficiency. Having picks with the same sell marker creates efficiency for your life when you're flipping sports cards because you can hop in at one time and list them. They're all ending at the same time. You can watch them all at the same time. You don't have to be looking at different sports in different areas. Efficiency. So I love the efficiency that you're using here. Quick and clean, easy, make your money, get out. Two, I think some people might be saying, Jane Daniels, didn't he just win the Heisman? Hasn't the marker already passed? Aren't his cards already going up? Maybe yes, but here's my thinking. If Jaden's already won the Heisman, the Heisman is going to bring more hype to his NFL draft viewership and watching. People want to know where the Heisman winner is going. So maybe you're getting in and not getting uh, the prices of pre-Heisman, but I think it's going to actually cause a bigger jump because he was the Heisman winner there. So love the overall picks. Anything else to add before I hop into mine, Paul? Yeah, before we get to yours, which I think are outstanding, I want to reiterate the point that you just made because I'm glad you called that out because I think here's what I'm doing with the Jaden Daniels. Like I mentioned in the overview, I said I... I a month ago, I was fading Jaden Daniels. I said it on The Chase, and The Chase has a big audience, and that was fun being on their show. And I'm, I'm happy to go on, on anyone's show and, and talk about my sports card strategies. But I, I did. I, I, I really went in hard on fading Jaden Daniels. And, and for the reasons you were talking about, he had just won the Heisman. So like, I'm not all about buying into a player right at their selling marker. Well, so a couple different things. It's a few weeks later now. People don't really care as much about the Heisman as they do about the national championship game, which for those of you watching live is tonight, right? So now people are, aren't really focused on Jaden Daniels anymore. And yes, exactly what you said. He is now on the radar. He is now, he wasn't necessarily going to be a first round pick before all this Heisman buzz. Now they're talking about him being a top five pick 
Now I have to learn from the landscape. Lefty's done a nice job in recent episodes talking about we have to learn from the landscape. Chad's really good at casting a wide net. I'm not. So I think sometimes I need to calibrate what I'm looking at. And to your point, same selling marker, not all that different of a play. Just be a little bit more open-minded about ways to make money on the 2024 NFL draft class and go in and find an easy, easy quick flip on Jaden Daniels. So that's it. I'm excited to hear what you've got, what you've got on your one. I know everyone else is excited to hear what uh, Connor Barnett, the Unicon has. So take it away in your 1K budget builder here, man. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm excited for this week. I actually, a couple of picks here to test you, to test your feedback for me. So curious to see the feedback that I get. Let's kick things off with my low end card. Uh, I'm going with another college football guy. I'm going with Travis Hunter. He's up there at our football rankings right now at nooffseason.com. If you're not using those rankings at a tool, be sure to use them. They are updated. 2023 Bowman Chrome University first prospect auto in raw. Trying to snipe these for the around the $80 range. I see a lot selling 85 to 100 bucks. You're getting three of them. Sell markers. You have multiple. Short term, strong performances next season. Uh, I think the hype's going to continue to build around him, Dion, and Shador. Um, long term, 2025 NFL draft. This is the one I'm really waiting for in case. Uh, he doesn't explode next season and, uh, to a point where I have to sell him. 2025 NFL draft, uh, I think he's going to be a lottery pick. Um, the reason that I think that he's such a good pick is because he is that two-way guy, right? So it's not something we see very often. And I think he's coming He's coming from playing for Dion as a two-way guy into the league, something that we don't see anymore. So I think the hype's really going to be big around him. I think he's a lottery pick. I'm curious. I really hope that wherever he goes, they don't try to put him on one side of the ball because if he comes in the league as an elite two-way player, he's going to have all the news hype. He's going to go high in the draft. I think this is a great way to make money. I think this card is super undervalued right now. That's the big thing. This card, what it's going for is just so cheap. So moving along, mid-tier, Donovan Mitchell. This is someone that Paul discussed recently. We've been pitching a lot of Darius Garland. We were saying when Donovan Mitchell moves, he's going to have all the time. But wait a second, Donovan Mitchell might be moving. That's a sell marker right there. So last, I'm looking at the 2017 Prism Silver PSA 10. Last sale, 180 bucks, down 10% the last 14 days, 30% over the last 90. Uh, we've discussed Mitchell being on the move to the Knicks in the near future, and also news recently dropped of the Miami Heat being seriously interested. So there's another contender or another suitor. This is timing the market. We're buying Donovan Mitchell at a dip, buy graded, and be ready to sell ASAP if slash once news of Mitchell getting traded drops. If he doesn't get traded, I'm not worried about it. This card's near its floor and at a 365-day low. I can hold for the next NBA hype cycle, the next 70-point performance from him, trades down the line, et cetera. So I have the the clear marker in sight, but if it doesn't pan out, I got backup. I'm hedging myself there. Give me a quick second to catch my breath, and then we will get into my third pick. Any feedback from the first two uh, well, before I roll into this last one, Paul? Travis Hunter, man. Travis Hunter's where it's at. I mean, you broke it down perfectly, but I'm just going to flag plant a little bit on top of your prediction on Travis Hunter. First of all, we do some show notes here and Connor had Travis Hunter in here before me. I went in, he did his first and then he tasked me with doing mine and I was going to put Travis Hunter in. And so I will say like, we do a little hyperbole on this show because we love hype, but just picture this. It's the lead up to the 2025 NFL draft. Travis Hunter's coming off a college football season where he was in the Heisman discussion or potentially was even at the downtown athletic club as one of the finalists or potentially even hoisted the trophy. He's that two way guy that Connor talked about. Now, as we lead up to the NFL draft and his 40 times clocking at the combine and teams are fighting over position for who's going to take him in the top five. Yes. Top five. And te there's even rumors of him going number one. Now picture this. He's doing an interview with Shohei Otani on SportsCenter, and they're talking to Shohei Otani about coming back as the two-way guy in 2025 for the Dodgers. And they're talking to Travis Hunter. You're the two-way guy. You're the Otani of football heading into the NFL. No one's ever really played run, uh, wide receiver and cornerback the way that you're going to do it, Travis. Yes, your coach, Coach Prime, Deion Sanders, did it a little bit in the pros, but he didn't. He wasn't really a wide receiver. Then Prime comes into the interview, and Prime's like, you're right, Scott Van Pelt. I really wasn't a wide receiver. My guy, Travis Hunter, he is really a wide receiver and a cornerback the way that I was. And Otani's like, yep, 
nobody really ever pitched and hit the way I did either. And now we got Travis Hunter, the Shohei Otani of football. I am, I could not be bigger on Travis Hunter. I, I mean, Donovan Mitchell, yes, I like that one too, Connor, but I am all in on the Travis Hunter play, baby. Love it. Quick confirmation from Paul Hickey before I head into my big one. And this is the one where I'm where I'm curious your feedback on. Before I hop into things, this is what I'm looking for in terms of an answer from you. Am I having too much speculation in this play? So let's hop into it. SGA, Shea Gilchrist, Alexander, 2018 Prism Silver PSA 10. She was in the comments, thought that Paul Hickey was rolling with SGA. He's not, but I certainly am. Prism Silver PSA 10. I don't think you're too late on buying this card. Uh, we've actually talked recently about the NBA card market being in kind of a lull period, uh, which is providing opportunity for a lot of different guys that are affordable right now. However, this card's actually up 32% the last 30 days, 20% the last 14, uh, but it is down 2% the last seven days. Last sale, just under 600 bucks, $595. So why am I buying this card if it's up over the last uh, 14 and 30 days? I have sell markers and I have several, but they are speculative. So that's why I have multiple sell markers for multiple different time periods, depending on my cash flow needs. So let's hop into each sell marker that I have. First would be the quick flip. Buy now, sell quick. I'm looking at the all-star game. Paul or Chad talked recently about starters in the all-star game having uh, typically seeing a bigger spike than kind of the reserves and it being an actual market to try to make profits here. Here's why I think I don't know that SGA is not necessarily going to be a starter. So right now he's third in the Western backcourt in terms of votes, but he is behind Steph and Luca. And I believe both of them will be on limited minutes. Steph being 35 years old, Luca being on an extremely heavy workload in Dallas and already missing five games a season. I expect SGA to get extensive minutes there. We've seen what he can do. We've seen him explode. He could be the guy that we see go for 40 or 50 points in the All-Star game. And at that point, I'm cool with selling this card quick. Okay, that doesn't pan out. That's fine. I can hold it for six months because I have the MVP race. He's currently third P, uh, third in the race per Kia MVP ladder. And here's why I think he's actually going to win it. I think it's the Steve Nash and the Steph Curry effect that we've seen in the last uh, decade and a half, really. Well, I guess two decades now since Steve Nash, but... So let's look at Steve Nash first, 2005 and 2006 MVP. In those two years, the Suns went 62 and 20 and 54 and 28. Uh, first in their division both years. The year before those two years, they were 29 and 53. Um, for those of you saying for SGA, he can't win, it's because Embiid and Jokic have these numbers, this and that, which are fair arguments. They're putting up crazy stats. Nash won the 04 05 MVP, averaging 15 points a game, 11.5 assists, and three rebounds. There were a number of guys in the league. Uh, who had more impressive stats, but it didn't matter because Nash was on the up-and-coming team and he was the leader of that team. The same thing for Steph Curry, 2014 and 2015, as well as 2015, 2016. They went 67 and 15, 73 after nine. They were a little bit better coming into those years, but they were they were 51 and 31 before that first MVP year, so they still won 16 more games than the year prior. Curry only averaged 23.8, four boards and seven assists, shot less than 50% from the field. Again, a lot of guys that arguably had better numbers, LeBron, Harden, guys like that. SGA has the best stats for a guard in the league and is on the rising team that everyone wants to see win. He's averaging 32, 6, and 6 on 55% from the field. The Thunder are second in the West at 23 and 11. The NBA needs a new face, and I think it's going to be SGA. They're going to take advantage of this. That's what we saw with Curry. They reward the leader of the up-and-coming teams. So there's your, your six-month sell marker, midterm sell marker got the uh, MVP award that I really believe he can win. Let's say he doesn't win. What if I'm wrong? Who cares, Paul? He's got more markers ahead. He's 25 years old. More MVP races, more finals pushes, more all-star games, more NBA hype cycles to just time the market. Even over the last 30 and 60 days, uh, with this card jumping last 14 and last 30, it's going for the same rate as Tyrese Halliburton, John ja Morant, and even Draymond Green's Prism Silver PSA 10. Uh, ultimately, I think the current valuation of this card is a fraction of what it will be in one to two years. And if the markers present themselves along uh, the way to make an early exit, fantastic. I'll hop out whenever I need to. So I really like this play. But one thing to, to note, if you're going to make this play, make sure you can tie up that cash flow uh, in this card so that you can wait for one of those sell markers that I have discussed to present themselves. That's a lot of talking, Paul. Curious to see your feedback. That's the key. The last thing you said is the absolute key. Make sure that you can afford having that money tied in. And here's why. The card, uh, the card's a $600 card. It's a significant amount of money. 
Um, but it is the right card for the right player at the right time. I agree with your analysis is spot on in terms of the different levels of sell markers. And the reason why being okay with having the cash flow tied up for so long is key is because I made rookie mistakes with cards at this price point that were the right card for the right player. But we used to joke on this show. For those of you that have been with us for a while, we used to joke on this show all the time about me being impatient. We haven't done that in a while. That's because I've gained patience because I've learned from my errors. And one of my errors was selling at that first marker. So that buy now, sell quick all-star game marker, I believe will not be the marker for this card. And the reason why is because SGA is too good of a player to quick flip at an all-star game. You said it. He's a potential MVP. So you hold an MVP until you know it's time to sell that MVP. You hold that MVP until like sell alert time. And when you try to move out of a guy who has a significant card like this, when you try to move out of the right card for the right player at the wrong time, you break even. And we don't want you breaking even. We want you making as much money as possible. The other thing I'll add to this, the reason why I believe it's the right card is because this is pre-2019, 2020 uh, print run explosions. You know, I don't have the data, but I know from chatter in the hobby that I've heard that the Ja and Zion year in 2019 was really a different year in terms of expanded print run than the pre Ja and Zion years. And so I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I know the print run of the 2018 Prism Silver for, for SGA, but I do feel good about the fact that it's a 2018 rookie and not a 2019, 2020, 2021 rookie. And so that's another reason why you've got to hold this card longer than your first two selling markers. I think, I think this is a longer term hold, but it's a phenomenal use of $600. Love it. Thank you for the breakdown. Yeah. I think more so the, the re the long-term play, like you're saying is most certainly the hold. I think that you're buying this card knowing that if a crazy spike happens earlier, that gets you the kind of profits that you're looking for that it's, it's a possibility. So it's really just making yourself more comfortable and tying up the cash flow for the extended yeah. time, because you know, dang, this could happen. And this card could jump to 900, a thousand dollars. And I could say, okay, time to get out and reinvest in more stable assets that my guys over at uh, the Sports Card Strategy Show are pitching on a weekly basis. But great expertise, great feedback from you there. Speaking of expertise, it's time to hear from our guy, Dr. Crack Chad Gill. What do you say, Paul? We got some Yeah, good we're going to queue up. Yes, uh, I'm excited. Ahead. We're going to queue up Dr. Crack's cracks here. Excited to have Dr. Crack on the show today. And uh, real quick before we do that, hello to Joey in the live chat. Craig's Cards 11 came in strong. Ozzy Alvarez, I see you. Good to see you there. Barry Sif, Barry and Jody Sif. Brian Steeler 714 pissed about the new start time, but then he comes back and says, uh, no worries, it's all good. Haven't seen you in a little bit. I know. I, so, hey, sorry, Brian. I mean, we, we definitely don't want to make you mad, brother. We want to do everything we can to, to keep you happy here in the no offseason fam. Brad Ton in the house on the opposite side can watch us live now due to the new start time. Mark D in the house. And I uh, just wanted to give some more live chat love before we queue up Dr. Crack. All right. So Dr. Crack, Chad Gill sat down with Connor Barnett to film an amazing segment, Dr. Crack's Cracks. It is going to be a recurring segment on the Sports Card Strategy Show, highlighting one of the many things Chad does best to help you guys make money flipping sports cards. Here it is. Now let's roll into probably my favorite segment to listen to Chad. Uh, speak on and that's uh, Dr. Cracks Cracks because this is something I feel like even though I don't have a ton of experience like I have a relatively decent knowledge base to follow the guys when they're making plays and I can still follow Chad here but the way that he finds these in the descriptions and, and the numbers that he's able to find and put together for some serious upside over here is always really intriguing to me and he does it across the board our last deep dive he had a ton of vintage stuff I've seen him do it with ultra modern cards he finds them so Chad, go ahead and roll into them. I'm excited to see what you have for me this week. All right. Well, I, I like when when we're when we're talking my specialty cracks, right? Doctor cracks cracks. Uh, when when you're talking a specialty, I like to go a little bit unique. 
I don't like to do the obvious. The obvious anybody can find. You're listening to this because you know that I'm going to find something that you're like, oh my gosh, that's cool. So I've got some cool ones here for you, Connor. The first is a tennis play. The Williams sisters, not Serena, not Venus. It is together. That is the name of the card, the Williams sisters. It's a 2003 net pro. It's card number 651 or G51. I can't even read my writing. It's G51. It's the glossy version. Here's what we're looking for, Connor. This card in a BGS 95 or an SGC 95. The most recent sale of a BGS 95 sold for $25. The most recent SGC sale sold for $30. It is 2000 or three. So therefore it's still, it's 1998 or newer. So it qualifies, I'm sorry, 93 or newer. So it qualifies for the $15 play at PSA for the, for the, when you resubmit in a bulk play. So you're going to have 25 to $30 invested, $15 for grading. So you're going to be anywhere from 40 to $45 with shipping and, and everything in, invested in this card. If you get a PSA nine and it goes down a half a grade, you are going to lose about $30. Here's where I talk about having a low floor, a, a, to, a risk tolerance that you can take, right? I'm willing to take a chance at losing $30 because a PSA 9 sells for $15. bucks. i am willing to take that chance because, Connor, a PSA 10, $649. Big discrepancy. Big discrepancy. This is where I talk about floors and high ceilings. This is a skyscraper type ceiling compared to a floor. When I tell you, Connor, that for thirty dollars, now you're a gambler. You like you like playing the numbers. You're other than the sports cards. If I told you that you had to place a thirty dollar bet that could return you six hundred and fifty dollars. Is that a bet that you would be willing to make? Particularly if the gym rates are decent. Absolutely. Yes. So here is the deal. This is only a pop 36. This card has only been graded 81 times. There are a lot of raw sales of this card. So this is another one. If you wanted to make the raw and try raw, this card sells raw for around $10. So if you didn't want to buy the pre-graded and try for the thing, you could go for a raw and grade. Between PSA 9 and 10, this card has a 67%. So you got a 67% chance of, of getting a 9 or a 10. The card only has a 20% gem rate. So you got a 1 in 5 chance. But where this improves, Connor, here's, here's why I love the math. I have my own spreadsheet. My own spreadsheet of cracks. Dr. Cracks cracks. I'm going to go for the BGS 9.5. And here's why. BGS 9.5, if you can find a BGS 9.5 that is a true BGS 9.5, so four 9.5 subgrades in a glossy card, my crack statistics show that I am going to upgrade from a BGS 9 to a 10 at a 58% clip. I don't care that it's a 20% gem rate. I don't care about that data because... We're not grading a raw card that we bought from somebody that's 15 or 18 or 20 years old and hoping for a gem. We're taking a card that a professional grader said it's a true gem mint 9.5 all the way around the board. PSA grades slightly easier than BGS on some of these cards. 58% chance I'm taking this all day long. Absolutely love it. Another example. So 
let me clarify what I said a minute ago. I said particularly if the gym rates are solid. What I what I should have said is particularly if the gym rate percentages outweigh the risk associated with the upside is yes. what I, is the correct term to use there, which is exactly what Chad's done here. And he has his own data slash data in his spreadsheets um, that gives him even more confidence in making this play. So absolutely love this one. I'm a sucker for that for the high upside, low front end capital investments here. That's those are places that I'd be comfortable taking the risk. So absolutely love this one out of you, Chad. One thing I wanted to ask you, because I know you got the answer for me from this. Uh, it came to my head as you were discussing the discrepancies between the pricing for the nines and the tens here. Do you have any insight as to why in some scenarios that discrepancy is so large? Is it is it is it often determined and relative to pop counts and grading returns? In this particular, yes, it, it, it can be. However, in this particular case, there is such a small number of collectors for tennis cards. You don't have the tens of thousands of people in the market buying Shohei Otani's to where somebody will be like, yeah, I'll pay 25 bucks for a PSA 8 because I just want an Otani. Right. There are probably more collectors of PSA 8 Shohei Otani's than people that collect tennis cards as a whole. So that's why that's why there's such a discrepancy in a, in a card like this. There are so few people collecting tennis cards right now that the people that are only want the 10s. A 9 is like a throwaway card at the moment. If you're looking at long-term holds, Connor, as the tennis market grows, there could be some very good, um, very good opportunities for growth in some of these PSA nines because this is a rare card even in a PSA nine, and it's of you know the goats of women's tennis, the the Williams sisters, for a twelve or fifteen dollar investment for a PSA nine. I could see buying one for 12 or 15 bucks and throwing it in a in a box and forgetting about it for 10 years and going, oh my gosh, this card's not worth a hundred bucks because there's that you know, Fanatics is 10x the market and there's now 10 times more uh tennis collectors. And because there aren't many PSA tens and not everybody can afford six hundred bucks, yeah, I'll give you twenty PSA nine. Generally speaking, you will see the difference between a PSA 9. This is this goes across the board regardless of, of sport or type of card. PSA 9s are generally about 25% the, the value of a PSA 10. So when you find a PSA 9 that is selling for, what, 1 16th the cost of a PSA 10, either the PSA 10 is overvalued which I don't think 650 bucks for a pop 36 is overvalued or the PSA nine is way undervalued. And I think that that's the case in this. And it's because there aren't many tennis collectors out there yet. Love it. That was again, perfect answer for me. there. super, uh, a lot of clarification for me and thank you for the explanation. Let's go ahead and roll into your next crack and submit play. I could not wait all day to tell you about this one, Connor. Who do we have open our every one of our shows? Oh, the rock music. The rock. We got to have a <laughs> rock track and submit. Come on now. Come on. We have the rock rookie card. We had to. I had to. I just had to do it. 1997 Cardinal WWF Trivia Series. The rock rookie card. Cool looking card. He's standing up there. He's he's it's a yellow background. It's a very cool looking card. This card is not an easy card to find. So this is a card that will take you a little bit of digging. The cool part about it is when you find it, there's no timetable on this. There is no there. There's no worrying. You don't have to worry about a sell marker on this because you're you're buying the grade you're cracking and you're going for an upgrade so the sell marker is as soon as you get it back because if it goes up the half a grade you're making bank that's the sell marker getting the half grade up is the sell marker in this play i personally am going to try this play because i want one for my personal collection i don't have a rock card and i don't know why i'm going to have Shocking. one 
2024, one of the 10 cards I am looking for, I have, a, I have a list of 10 cards that I plan on collecting in 2024. I put this on it today. This is number 10. I am going to have myself a PSA 10, the Rock Rookie card. However, we're not talking about PSA 10 for this because they're too expensive, Connor. PSA 9 is 300 bucks. A PSA 10 is 10 grand. I'm going for the PSA 9. So first of all, the PSA 10 is a very low pop count. That's why it's so expensive and it's the rock. I mean, the greatest. I mean, he's the greatest. He's I mean, he's the goat of goats. Come on now. He's the entry song to our show it's got to be the greatest but we're gonna go we're gonna go chase after the bgs 8.5 the most recent sale of this car was card was was less than 30 days ago the card this bgs 8.5 had five sales in 2023 so it's not like it's a unicorn it's not like it can't be found it's not a high volume card but the last sale was for $70. The sale before was 72. The sale before that was 65. So let's call it what the last sale was, $70. A PSA 9 is 300 bucks. A PSA 8 is 100 bucks. You can buy this card in an 8.5. This, this card, is a 97, so it's still 93 or newer, so it qualifies for the $15 PSA special. You're going to buy it for 70. You're going to spend 15 in grading. Let's call it, let's round up and say we got $90 invested, and it drops a half a grade. It sells for 100 bucks in PSA 8. This is the floor I'm talking about. This is why when you find plays like this, this is why it's the least risky flipping or investing that you can do because you can drop a half a grade and make 10 bucks. That's the type of flip I'm looking for. But if it if it jumps the half a grade to a PSA 9, you're going to go from $70 to 300. That's 4Xing your money. So that's the card I'm looking for. There is one caveat in a BGS 9. Now it adds a little bit more risk because the floor has a negative value. But a BGS 9, there have been 29 sales of this card in BGS 9 in 2023. So that tells me it's six times easier to find than the, P than the BGS 8.5. The last sale of this also was in the last 30 days. It was $144. Now you add the grading fee, you're at 160 if it drops a whole grade from BGS 9 to PSA 8, you're going to lose about 60 bucks. But if it jumps up to a, or if it stays the same and gets a PSA 9, you double your money from 160 to 300. My statistics show a BGS 9 to a PSA 9 is at a 68% clip. So you make a little bit less money, you raise your risk of the floor going BGS 9. If you can find the BGS 8.5, you almost can't lose because dropping a half a grade, you still make money. You 4X your money. But the BGS 8.5 to a PSA 9 is only 44% in my rankings. So you drop 24% in a chance to get that PSA 9. So it's up to your risk tolerance in your wallet which one you want to do. You want to go the safe route, spend a little less money, have a little lower chance of getting that jump, go the BGS 8.5 route if you want to take a little bit more risk, but you have a much higher chance of getting that crossover and you can double your money, go with the BGS 9. Love it, Chad. Not only is Chad finding the crack and submit plays, he's finding multiple plays within the same play depending on how much, one, risk tolerance you have, two, upside you're looking for. And who doesn't love Dwayne The Rock Johnson? So absolutely love this pick here, Chad. Great breakdown. Good work finding two different options for the same car that you can make money on, depending on what your strategies are and what your goals look like. So great work there. Dr. Crack yep. is the best. He's the yep. best. Couple things to take away, Paul. I'll let you I'll let you chirp in, but just real quick. He is so good at going where they ain't. We talk about going where they ain't. 
this man is the king of finding opportunities. We've been talking about that between me and you a lot lately, Paul. Finding opportunities. Chad is the master at finding these opportunities. I want to ask you a question real quick, Paul. So for these Kraken submits, for someone that is newer to the hobby like myself, I think this might be a more intimidating play to try to make. So let's try to talk about, I know that sometimes they're hard to find these cards. It's not like a bulk thing that everyone in here can do. However, I do think these plays are fantastic, but are they particularly for people that uh, are already, like, are they just for people that are already making Ws, established in the hobby, have the cash flow? Or with, with Chad finding things that have uh, high floors and low risk, are these plays for everybody? Yeah, Chad's plays are for everybody because he does, he doesn't, he doesn't recommend anything that he that he wouldn't do himself, and he and he's actually uh, he has a very low risk tolerance related to the crack and submits. He is very he's very uh, analytical with it. I mean, he you know he mentions his data and and that's real. So we got to respect him for that. Um, Brian Steeler seven one four kind of came into the comments live chat as you were making the point that yeah, there's not. Uh, there's not many graded in, in some of these cards, but I think chat, you know, Brian says there's only 17 graded BGS eight fives. And that's a great point by Brian. I think Chad also gives that disclaimer and that caveat whenever he gives these plays, which is what I really like about it. Like it, they're all very relevant and they're not, and, and they're based in real, the reality of whether or not you can do it. And, and, and for the cards with low pop count, the cards that are harder to find to, to make these plays with, Chad tells you that and he tells you like, you're not gonna be able to do this in like six days. You're going to have to wait six months or longer to, to find this card, but it's, it's worth it in a lot, in a lot of ways. Totally agree. Uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and kick things over to the NFL playoffs, NFL playoff strategy. You've thrown together uh, some really good information for the audience. You want to hop into uh, all the good stuff that you got cooking up over there? We try to be as relevant and timely as possible. And the most relevant and timely thing going on right now is the NFL playoffs related to flipping cards. I mean, we can't not provide top-notch content related to what to do during the NFL playoffs. So we've put together a NFL cheat sheet for crystallizing profits and maximizing profits during the NFL playoffs. So visit nooffseason.com now through the end of the NFL playoffs to access our nooffseason.com 2024 NFL playoffs football card selling cheat sheet. This is a profit maximization plan that will include players to sell, recommended ways to list, including timing on when to end auctions, uh, which is very important to follow it uh, every day, every week. The NFL playoffs are here and it's time to start listing your cards. It's time to liquidate your NFL cards you've been holding on to for the teams in the playoffs. Why? Because so much changes in the offseason. There's so much uncertainty. The selling marker is upon us, everyone, and it's time to get specific. This is what our cheat sheet at nooffseason.com does. Connor, we don't want the audience holding the wrong cards into the offseason. Guys, we don't want you holding the wrong cards in the off season. We want you all to maximize profits, but taking profits when they're there rather than trying to get the maximum possible profit. I think that's the, that's the biggest takeaway from this cheat sheet. When you access it, you're going to see that there's a lot of context around it. It's not just, it's not just a quick, uh, sell this guy now, uh, wait, wait on this guy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's pretty in-depth. We want to mitigate risks against single-game elimination with unknown outcomes. Um, we want to mitigate risk against injuries and poor individual performances. So keep in mind there are players we believe it's okay to hold heading into next season, even if you miss the selling window. But there are others, in fact, most of the players, we believe it's best to liquidate now, get the cash so you have the flexibility to either buy back into them later in the offseason or reinvest into other areas. So this will be available on nooffseason.com's homepage throughout the NFL playoffs. If you go there and it's not there yet, keep checking back. It'll be there now through the end of the NFL playoffs. If you have questions about it, email me at paul at nooffseason.com. This is a new service offering. First time we've ever done it. Super excited about it. It's a cheat sheet, so it should be very easy to follow. It'll have strategies on uh, buy it now or best offer versus auction broken down by player and it'll be updated weekly. Yeah. As someone who has access to this cheat sheet, 
Uh, first, I want to give all the all the kudos here to Paul that because he's he's thrown this together uh, essentially by himself. But this is fantastic. It's got a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of good information in it. And if you're someone that's holding football player cards right now and you don't know what to do with them, this is going to be your spot to figure out uh, kind of what to do with those cards, especially for guys that are still active in these playoffs. We also have more content coming your way at NoOffSeason.com. Sorry for some of the guys that have been eliminated. What you should be doing with those cards? So uh, we got a lot of good stuff coming football related. Like you're like you were saying, Paul, stay as relevant as possible. A um, lot of good stuff there. With that being said, let's hop into some uh, audience some audience content for everybody. We got our guy Mike Lacusta, uh, who's going to share some of his 2024 goals. Paul, if you want to go ahead and cue that up uh, for the listeners. Yeah, we asked everybody to submit their 2024 goals. If you have 2024 goals, you can email Connor and I, Paul at nooffseason.com, Connor at nooffseason.com, C-O-N-N-E-R. But we emailed some of you specifically that we know really well. And Mike is a fellow content creator in the hobby at Fondling Cardboard, at The Golf Card Collector on Instagram. Go check out his stuff. He's got a wonderful podcast where he pontificates PCing versus versus investing quite a bit. And uh, Mike has some great goals for 2024. Here they are. What's up, Paul and listeners? This is Mike Lacusta, a.k.a. The Golf Card Collector. Paul asked me to share some of my hobby goals for 2024, so here we go. First and foremost, Paul, this will bring a smile to your face, but I need to admit to myself that I stockpile too many cards. Um, <laughs> Paul calls it hoarding. I call it collecting at its finest. But every card that I've bought has had utility value to me in some way. The fulfillment of working towards a project, collecting a player that I like, uh, completing a set, dabbling into something new, uh, or something exciting that's captivated me in the moment, like F1 cards, for example. Some of those projects are complete, some are left unfinished, uh, and some cards have just simply lost their luster to me. So whatever the reason, one of my goals is to reset baselines for these projects that I'm working on. Uh, sell or trade the cards that have used up their utility value for me and basically get organized. Uh, and along with that, I, I, I hesitate even saying this, but I'm going to throw it out in the universe and may, maybe I'll stick to it. I would like to implement a one-for-one -one policy in my personal collection. And what that means is in order for me to buy or acquire new cards, I need to get rid of an old card. So it's one in, one out. Uh, that way, my collection will stay the same size, but can continue to improve over time. It's been hard to convince myself to do something like that because um, the minimal time I spend in the hobby, I just enjoy uh, being with my cards. And to, in order to implement a one-for-one, -one, you have to really get to know yourself and your collection. And, you know, I haven't really had the time to do that between family, work, and everything else. Um, so I, I guess I can convince myself though, if I put in some work, my collecting experience will become more enjoyable over this next year because it, though it's, it's always, it's always kind of awkward to, to pull off a, a dusty box from the top of your desk and find some cards that you loved at one point and you just completely forgot you had them as a collector. I want to know what's in my collection. So moving on, uh, I want to, um, I, I have this perspective that I don't want to take the hobby too seriously. Um, if you listen to my podcast or if you've talked to me, you might think I, I take it very seriously, but at the end of the day, I consider it a hobby. Like when I play basketball or when I golf or when I'm just shooting the shit with my friends, like that's really what the hobby experience is about. Uh, it's a pastime and I want to treat it more that way. Uh, I'm not investing in my cards. I'm doing this purely for my own enjoyment. Um, next up, let's get into some podcast goals. So, I have a podcast called Fondling Cardboard. I know it's a funny name. To me, card fondling means that you are collecting and enjoying the cards themselves and not focusing on the value or anything else. It's all about the materialistic cardboard. Um, so in terms of goals, I, I don't care about traditional numbers. Um, I don't get paid advertisement revenue or sponsorship, sponsorships. So at the end of the day, uh, it's all about the engagement and the co community fulfillment. So my goal is to increase engagement and enjoyment of the stuff that I put out into the world. Uh, I want more comments and interactions on my stories, my posts, more one-on-one -on -one conversations with other hobby participants, um, and more guests featured on my podcast. And, and I would really appreciate actually having more perspectives. So Paul, I've really enjoyed having you, for example, on the investor versus collector series that I am currently in the middle of. Um, 
two episodes have published already that Paul has contributed to and two more to come. And one of my goals, I guess, for the podcast is to continue bringing more voices to the small platform that I have um, and to collaborate with hobbyists that have opposing views uh, rather than just dealing with echo chamber like-minded collectors. Um, So, you know, at the end of the day, I want to treat this hobby as an escape. Um, I want to enjoy the parts of the hobby that I like and outsource the ones I don't. So that may mean I have to go through uh, consignment services. That may mean I need to ask somebody to help me with my content creation. Uh, But at the end of the day, I want to spend my time, my hobby time, doing the things that I enjoy. Uh, I'm going to rattle off because I'm going, (laughs) this is going a little over time, but uh, I've probably got a half a dozen more to go. So uh, I want to manage my spending habits. Buy what I love, make lists, prioritize. Don't just buy for the sake of satisfying buying impulse. Um... Treat the hobby as an escape. I want to do direct sales instead of feeding third-party platforms. Keep tabs on my grail cards. This is a big one, and I do actually have one card in mind. And I want to continue building rapport with the owner of that card so that in the event that they ever decide to get rid of it, I want to be the first person that they think of um, so that when they're, they're ready to sell, I get a stab at it. And I want to use my PC to express myself and what I love, and that's all that matters at the end of the day. Uh, the cards don't have to mean anything to anyone else as long as I collect them. I don't plan on selling them. They mean something to me. Uh, And lastly, don't be jealous of others. Be selfish uh, about what I enjoy while cheering on what others have going on. But at the end of the day, I can't afford everything that someone else can, so I need to enjoy my hobby experience the way I can. Looks like my little guy needs a bottle feed, so (laughs) saved by the bell. You can hit me up at The Golf Card Collector on Instagram. My podcast is Fondling Cardboard. Thank you for tuning in. Paul, I can't wait to chat. Cheers. Thanks, Mike. Great job by Mike. Um, Fondling Cardboard, The Golf Card Collector on Instagram. What's interesting, Connor, is that so we're the only sports card podcast that I'm aware of that is like 100% unapologetically flipping cards. And we come out and we say it at the beginning, at the end, and several times throughout every single episode, we don't care about this, we don't care about that, we only care about you guys making money. And that's true. What's interesting is I've learned a lot about hobbyists in our hobby, or the hobby as we like to call it, Um, and I think that there's a lot more similarities than differences when you look at the why and the tactical day by day, week by week between flippers and PCers. And Mike does an amazing job of being like very introspective about those differences. He's very thoughtful with the way that he puts together his content. So along the way, what ends up being kind of funny is that even though he identifies as a collector and as a PCer, he's a pretty darn good flipper. If you listen to his podcast, even though he kind of pontificates on, he he struggles He struggles admitting that he's a flipper, but he's a pretty darn good flipper. And so when you listen to his podcast, you find a a lot of really good selling tips and a lot of really good flipping tips, even over at Fondling Cardboard, where it's primarily a PC only podcast. And so we're going to talk to a lot of people like Mike throughout the year, right here on the NoOffSeason.com Sports Card Network and the Sports Card Strategy Show. Kind of excited to be doing something a little bit different, allowing people Uh, with a different perspective on the show. Would love to know the audience and your take and your thoughts because I know a lot of you out there flip to fund your PC. So um, I thought that was interesting for Mike and there'll be more from people like him as well. Uh, Jason Silva, Shane Graham in the house, Connor, as we get over to the audience QA. What do we got? Yeah, let's hop right into it. Kicking things off, Power Bros Collect. Big W to share, especially with Lefty. A few weeks back or so, I shared that I purchased Two times Yamamoto Saiku Refractor, Jim Tens for 300 bucks, sold upon the news of big contract for a total of 665, more than 2x his initial investment. We love hearing this, Paul. Lefty called this play he planted on Yamamoto months ago, and a lot of people won from it, Lefty included. I challenged him too. I was like, are we sure about this? And Lefty came through, Power Bros Collect. Glad that you followed Lefty and, and got a win on this one, man. That's awesome. Yeah, shout out Lefty McKee. We got we got a lot more content revolving 
around Lefty winning 2024. So this is just a start uh, of hearing from these wins for Lefty. Up next, we got Janelle Shu. We kicked off the show talking about these Tops Now plays, uh, when and how to make money on Tops Now. She says, sounds like a similar way to think about the SI for kids. If there aren't any other cards, then the SI for kids could work. What do you think, Paul? Is this a good correlation to make here? Yes. Janelle's spot on. They're in the same category because uh, Tops Now kind of fills a gap before the right card exists. And that's exactly the same context we've always talked about the SI for kids card. So she's spot on with this. Love it. Yeah, her head's always in a good place. Good correlation to make here. So good point there, Janelle. Up next, one Galaxy Germ. Caitlin Clark's WNBA Prism rookie will likely be out in November. So there's little time to flip before the set hits. Yeah, that's another reason to maybe stay away from buying these Caitlin Clarks. What are your thoughts, Paul? Yeah, man, the Bowman Chrome. I'm just going to say it again, guys. Bowman Chrome first prospect auto. Bowman Chrome first refractor. Bowman Chrome first um, base PSA 10. Those are the Caitlin Clark cards. So one Galaxy Germ on the money. Good insight there. Um WNBA Prism is going to supersede all of that with the RC Shield. It's silver, like picture like the Caitlin Clark WNBA Silver Prism with the RC Shield. That's going to be the card. Yep, love it. And I would, I do want to ask you something, Paul. So Galaxy Germ is bringing this up here as if you're buying, you better be doing it quickly because you don't have much time before that uh, that next card drops. So is is this a scenario where? where you got to get rid of even the ones that, that you're uh, the cars that you're pitching as a, as a way to not to avoid kind of losing value when those new releases hits, we've been talking about CJ Stroud and things like that is a similar scenario. That's what I don't like about the tops now, because you got it. It's like, you got, you got to play hot potato with it. And I just don't like that. But with the Bowman Chrome first prospect cards, there's the clear selling marker where you can say, Look at the release date calendar. Her WNBA prism isn't going to come out until she's on a WNBA team. The WNBA draft is going to be after the college season ends, pretty much immediately after the college season ends, and then the WNBA season starts. So it's very clear with the Bowman Chrome First Prospect Auto what to do and the, and the Bowman Chrome First Prospect cards. You have them the way that you have them. If you, if you have time to grade them, fine. You sell them during selling markers that would be a if she blows up during the women's tournament b wnba draft liquidate all of them that's the sell by date is the wnba draft the markers ahead of that could be performance spikes during the tournament if iowa wins it i mean that'd be huge sell then um worst case scenario sell during wnba draft reinvest those funds into wnba prism um after the singles calm down a little bit but yeah don't you know, so she could be the player that you make money on uh, again and again, like we talked about in last week's episode with Shadur and Wemby. But uh, it's it's clear as day with the with the Bowman Chrome Prospect Auto. Did I did I do you feel like that was clear, Connor? Like, do I need to definitely okay. definitely okay. Bowman Chrome babies? All right, up next, crazy old guy. Can someone kick me in the ass for wasting yes. so much money in breaks? I'm addicted and can't stop. Name checks out here, Paul. The name checks out. How can we help, crazy old guy? Easy. Crazy old guy, you need to email me at paul at nooffseason.com and you need to sign up in February when spots open up for that one-on-one -on -one strategist package and we will kick you in the ass. That's what we're doing. You can ask any of the people that are in that one-on-one -on -one strategist package. We've we've kicked off meetings already with some of them and we're just ass kicking. Yep. Love it. Next, Shane Graham just threw this in the chat and I wanted to touch on it because it, it dropped like an hour ago, maybe, uh, maybe two hours ago. Tiger splitting from Nike. Guys, do you think the news of Tiger splitting from Nike will have any effect on his cards, good or bad? Paul, my answer is no. I don't think this will have a big enough effect to matter, but I am curious your thoughts. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't think I don't think it's going to matter at all. I will make a slight joke. I basically only wear Nike all the time. Like the the running joke since I've been like 10 years old is how many swooshes are on my body. Um at any given time. <laughs> um, so I, to me, this actually hurts Tiger personally because Nike is the company for me. But um, no, I don't think it hurts him at all. I don't think it hurts him at all. I think he, you know, he's the goat and uh, it's Tiger. And I don't think, I don't think switching brands um, ma really matters at all. Totally agree. Spoiler alert for those interested in seeing where tiger goes he's going to be signing with grayson clothiers you heard it here first that's where he will be signing where charlie just signed up next we got joey paul going full-time congrats brother 
super exciting for the content consumer. I'm ecstatic as well, Joey. Paul, what you got to say on coming full time over here? I mean, it's putting my money where my mouth is. I mean, how can you guys believe me that? How can you believe my advice on how to make money flipping sports cards if I'm not doing it for myself? You know, I've been doing it for myself for a couple of years now. And now it's time to do, you know, the, to crank it up a notch level up. So that's what we're doing here. And then really, you know, that's part of it. The other main part of it is like nooffseason.com is part of me. It's like an appendage. You know, I started it when I was in my early 20s as a fantasy football dynasty fantasy football website. And it was my first startup. And uh, I was fortunate enough to grow it to where it was pretty large. I, I, I exited it at, at one point, but kept the domain name. And um, I'm back. We rebooted the brand uh, three or four years ago. And here we are. And it's time. So age 42, it's time to uh, put put all of it into nooffseason.com. And I'm happy to have all of you, all of you uh, along the journey with me. Appreciate all of your support. Thanks, Joey. Uh, thanks to everybody out there. I think that might be a fantastic way uh, to close down today's show, Paul. I echo everything that just came from your end. I think we got a lot of good value in there today, and I'm pumped to have you full-time alongside me. We're going to keep pumping out great value to all you guys. Be sure to check out all the premium offerings that we have at nooffseason.com. We're going to help you guys make money flipping sports cards. Paul, you got anything else to add, sir? No, nope, we'll see you again soon. We got another one coming up on Wednesday, baby. So we'll see you all then. And again, just don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Sports Card Strategy. Check out the Discord, sportscardstrategy.com. We'll see you again in about 48 hours, everybody. Let's do it. Thanks so much for being here with us on the Sports Card Strategy Show. To connect with us further, please subscribe to the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Paul Hickey. Please also give us a follow on Instagram at Sports Card Strategy and on X at No Off Season Card. We also have a Discord that you could join at sportscardstrategy.com. Everyone, I'm Paul Hickey. For the rest of us here at nooffseason.com, have a great day. We'll see you again soon.